Okay, for our next Bible study, we're going to be looking at the subject of the filling of the Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and we'll do a little bit of comparison with what we call the baptism of the Spirit. Now, one of the things we'll see in some of the terminology that's used here in the Bible, we'll see that some of the terminology that we are going to be talking about and we have to explain because some of the terminology is not quite clear in, the, in how the terms are used, or the terms might be used similarly. For example, we've titled this today, we've titled this The Filling of the Spirit, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but we're going to pray and ask God to bless us as we study these concepts and ask for God's wisdom. So we pray, Lord, that you would be with us today as we discuss these topics. Help us to present them clearly in that way that we could understand as uh, believers. We also pray for our those who are listening. We pray for those who are watching, listening. We also pray, God, for those that are believers already. We hope this will be helpful to them. You would speak to them. Maybe speak to Christians who are nominal Christians. They may be Christians. They're saved, but they're out of your will. And we pray, God, that you would speak to them, convict to them, not not because of me, but because of the word of God that you've given here, as I'm just a vessel and a tool for that. But we pray that you would work. We also pray for those that are maybe unsaved, not believers at all. And hopefully this will help them now too. You would convict them of their need of salvation. So we pray for these concepts and ask that you bless us now. Help me to explain them and under, so that we can all understand and benefit from them. And we ask that in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, we're going to give you several things here. First of all, by way of introduction, we're introducing you to the topic of the filling of the Spirit. Now, that word itself is kind of a misnomer of the way we are using it, the way the New Testament uses it. I remember taking classes in Bible college and seminary where we had to explain the filling of the Spirit and what it means. Well, it's a term... That's really, we have to explain the concept and we have to explain what it means and then we have to explain how you do it. Well, for example, what I did is I went and got me a glass here and this is the terminology sometimes that's used and we're going to show you that in the book of Acts and other places where the scripture, the Bible itself uses the terminology. For example, we would say the person is filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, the word fill gives a, it's kind of a misnomer. It's not really clear as to what it means. It gives, it's an inaccurate word. For example, this glass here is half full. It would be full, I would have to put it all the way up here. I cannot say that this, this glass is full of the Holy Spirit. It's not even full of water. I would have to fill it all the way up there to say this glass is filled with water or filled with the Holy Spirit. This glass is only half full. So does that mean that we only have half of the Holy Spirit at some times? Does that mean we only have a quarter of the Holy Spirit at some times? Does it mean we have three quarters of the Holy Spirit at times? Maybe we only have a quarter of the Holy Spirit. Now, somebody say, well, maybe we don't have any of him. Well, yeah, you do, but you wouldn't be a believer if you didn't have any of the Spirit. But you see, what I'm trying to say here is that term is really not clear. It's kind of a, a deceiving term to say that, that this is half filled or full of the Holy Spirit. It implies that you could be half filled with the Holy Spirit or a quarter filled with the Spirit. But that's not true. That's not what the Bible is saying here. So we have the difficulty of explaining this term. We also have, have the difficulty of explaining how one is filled, whatever that means. We're going we're gonna to give you that in a minute as to what it means, okay? There's a difficulty sometimes in these terms, and sometimes they're used similarly. There's a, different, there's a difference in the filling of the Spirit, 
And there's a difference in the baptism of the Spirit. There's a difference in the sealing of the Spirit. There's a difference in the giving and the gifts of the Spirit. They're all different reasons, different purposes, different meanings. And so that's what one of the reasons we're trying to explain some of these today for believers and Christians who they may be filled with the Spirit, okay? We hope believers are. But that doesn't mean they've only got a quarter of him. That's not what that means, all right? So there is a misconception sometimes around what we call the baptism of the Spirit. And someone could add to that the difficulty of distinguishing between the filling of the Spirit in the Old Testament that we've already looked at or the filling of the Spirit in the New Testament. Now, we already explained to you in one of our Bible studies that, a, that believers were, in fact, indwelt by the Spirit. The Spirit was in them. It says many times in the Old Testament, the Spirit was in them. It uses other terms to imply the Spirit's uh, power over their lives, and we're going to show you that in our topic today or tonight. But there's all these misconceptions that we have to deal with as believers as to what they mean. And they are confusing, granted. And then, of course, the way to be filled, okay, if the command, Ephesians 5.18, is to be filled, then how do you be filled? How do you do that? How do you get this glass of water filled? If that's the Holy Spirit, then how do you get all of it? Or are you operating with just a part of him? These are misunderstanding, easy to be, to be misunderstood terms that we as theologians, Bible stu students will have to interpret. Okay, so let's look at a little bit about, about the filling of the Spirit. We give you an introduction, and then we'll show you the disciples were filled with the Spirit. So it, we give you the first point here is the filling of the Spirit contrasted with the baptism. Then we're going to explain, okay, what the filling means. Uh, the filling is contrasted with the baptism. Now, you have heard sometimes other different denominations will use the term baptism of the Spirit. For example, someone may come up to you and they'll say, have you received the Holy Spirit since you were a Christian? Well, that, that was asked in the book of Acts. Apostle Paul asked, some disciples that question. They, he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you were believers? And they said, we, we've never heard of a Holy Spirit before. How do you get this Holy Spirit? Well, they'd never heard of it. Well, there are some groups today who are teaching that you can be saved today and you will get the Holy Spirit at a later time. That's not biblically correct, theologically nor theologically correct, it may appear in the book of Acts that that was the case. But remember, the book of Acts was a transitionary period. So we don't base all of our theology or interpretation on the book of Acts. It's a time when God was making a transition. So there are some things he did first time that he, that he doesn't have to do again. For example, like the day of Pentecost itself. The Spirit of God came at Pentecost. But we do not need to pray in our Sunday morning services, Lord, send us another Pentecost. We do not do that. We do not have to do that. The Spirit has already come. We do not have to pray and ask God to send the Spirit. He's already here. He's here in, in us, as we've already seen. So there are some things we don't need another Pentecost. There are some groups that use the term Pentecostal, and they are going by the book of Acts and what is happening here, and they're applying that as normal interpretation or, or activity or behavior. Well, that was not really a normal case because it was a once-in-a-lifetime event. So the Spirit came at Pentecost, and he baptized believers, and we're going to see that in our next Bible study about the body of Christ. So the baptism of the Spirit is different from the spilling of the Spirit. 
Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus said, in being assembled together with the disciples, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So here he mentions, Jesus mentions in verse 5, the baptism of the Spirit. He says it's going to come. So the Spirit comes, okay, in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, and we'll show you that. Okay, if you look in chapter 2, verse 1, these again, what I'm showing you here is kind of confusing terminology. When the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, verse 1, was filled, fully come, filled up. Notice the term filled and how it's used here by Luke. When the day of Pentecost was filled or fully here, filled up, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Okay, the day of Pentecost was filled, was fully come, filled up. They were all filled where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So notice here, okay, in chapter 2, verse 13 also, the disciples were speaking in uh, dialects, languages. Verse 13 says, others were mocking them. These men are filled with wine, alcohol. They're drunk is what he's saying. They're drunk. They're filled with alcohol. Now, that's a key that we're going to be showing you in just a minute. It indicates that the filling might have something to do with control. And we're going to show you that in just a minute. Okay, so the disciples themselves, if you look at the terminology, we've seen the very similar languages, okay? The baptism of the Spirit, and the filling of the Spirit. But they're not the same thing. They are two different things. So brings us to our next point here. The disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit many times. There's another difference, okay? We don't have time to cover all this, but the baptism of the Spirit happens at salvation. We are baptized or placed into the body, immersed into the body of Christ. It's vastly different from the filling. I'm going to show you that right now. Now, look at, okay, there you have the baptism. Jesus said the baptism will take place. Spirit comes, baptizes them into the body of Christ. And then we're going to show you, okay, that the disciples were all filled many different times. So you've heard the saying, okay, one baptism, many fillings. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. I'm going to show you this. We already seen in chapter 2, okay? We also saw there in chapter 2, okay, the disciples were filled. They were filled with the Spirit, chapter 2, verse 4, all right? Now if you go to chapter 4, verse 8, then Peter, he says, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, you rulers of people, of the people and elders of Israel, if you go to chapter same chapter, verse 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they were all assembled together, where they were assembled, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, would that imply, perhaps in these verses, that the Holy they have all of him, half of him, a quarter of him? Well, they certainly got some of him. That's very clear. But this verse is saying they were filled with the Spirit. Now, okay, chapter 6, verse 8. What I'm showing you here is the filling took many different times. 
All right, chapter 6, verse, it says, Stephen was filled with faith and power, and he did great wonders and miracles among the people. Stephen was full of the Spirit and faith and power. All right, chapter 6, also, if you look at verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the Spirit by which he spoke to them. All right, if you go to chapter 7, verse 55, it says, But he, again, Stephen was, as you know, stoned, but he being full, filled with the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly unto heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, does that imply half of him, a quarter of him? Three quarters of him? Chapter 9, verse 17. After Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, remember the story, Acts chapter 9. Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on Paul, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared unto you in the way as you came, hath sent me that you might receive thy, your sight and be filled with with the Holy Ghost, or filled or full of the Holy Ghost. Now, these are references I'm reading to you to show you that there were many different cases where the believers were filled again with the Holy Spirit. So that really is a command, actually, for all believers, all of us. I'm going to show you that, and then we're going to talk about what the control or the filling means. So if you go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is writing to believers, of course. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, he gives an interesting statement. He says, do not be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command. According to this passage, it's a commandment that we are to be filled with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not really, as I've been trying to show you here, these words and terms are not really totally explained in the Bible. And also what's not explained is, well, how do you do it? There's no real formula that I have seen in my study in different areas of college or seminary training or my own, I have not really seen per se a formula for how you do this. And I asked one of my discussion questions, I asked my students, well, if we're commanded to be filled by the Spirit, what does it mean and how do you do it? Is there a formula? Do you have to pray beforehand? Well, we saw in those references not always was one pray first. Okay, do we have to stop smoking cigarettes or do we have to stop doing this before we're filled with the Spirit? Well, those questions are not really answered. So you have to go to your study books, your theology books, and find out what's the formula? How do I do it? Well, maybe it's not as difficult as we are making out to be. Because Paul says here, and again, if you take the glass, that I've shown you here, where he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled or full of the Spirit. That verse is telling me basically one thing. When he says, do not be drunk with wine, what he's saying here is don't be under the control of alcohol. But, Paul says, you are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit instead of the alcohol. But you know the contrast. Drunk with wine, filled with the Spirit. Now, the essence of being filled with the Spirit is I've already left that out of the bag. He's saying, don't be under the control of liquor or alcohol but you are to be controlled 
and under the control of the Spirit of God. You say, well, what are some similarities? Well, I wrote some of those things down. I wanted to show the, uh, what he's talking about here explained a little better. So when he says be filled, he says be under, bottom line, the control of the Spirit. Now, let me, I'm going to show you here. I want to give you a few things about alcohol here. I'm not going not to give a whole lot of this, but I do want to sh share some of the things because that's what Paul is making the analogy, the contrast. If you've ever seen a person that's drunk before, and we all have, we may have friends, people that we know, and we know they get drunk, okay? They have a little too many beers or they drink too much, they get drunk. And you'll notice, okay, if you're talking to that person, you'll notice that there is a change in their character, their personality, sometimes their different mannerisms when they are under the control of liquor or alcohol. So I want to show you the comparisons here. Now, I'm well aware of the debate that goes on in Christian circles today about liquor and alcohol, beer, wine, etc., so I am well aware of all those debates. I've known them for 42, 43 years. I remember as a young Christian, I was working at Epps Air Service in Atlanta, the airport. And I had just been saved in 1978, and I worked at a, a hangar with all men mechanics, okay? If you've ever worked at a place where there's only men working there, well, as, a seven, as an 18-year-old teenager, I heard everything I could hear from those men mechanics. I heard everything that came out of their mouths from when it regards to women, to sexuality, whatever the case may be, vulgarity, profanity. I've heard, I've heard all of them from men mechanics. I was an 18-year-old teenager. I had just been saved, but I, I was exposed to a bunch of men mechanics so I know I heard everything I was to hear at 18 years old. I made a statement one day. I said, well, drinking is wrong or sinful. And one of them said, where does it say that in the Bible? And one of them said to me, he said, well, Jesus drank wine. And, you know, I, I was a young Christian. I didn't know how to counter that. I'd never been to Bible college or seminary. I didn't know a whole lot about the Bible. I started reading it. I didn't know how to answer the question. Well, Jesus did drink wine. Yeah, he said that. So I went to my pastor, Jake Reed. I said, Brother Reed, how do I answer this question? I've got these men mechanics challenging me about drinking, and they're telling me Jesus drank wine. So how do I counter that as a Christian? Well, he said, you tell them this. You tell them if they live their life exactly like Jesus lived, it will be okay for them to drink wine. That's what he told me. Well, that's the best answer I've ever heard in my life. But what happens, okay, when a person, so I'm well aware under the debate, is it wrong, is it sinful for a Christian? The Bible actually condemns, if we know, drunkenness. It, it does condemn that very clearly. It is very clear about, about being drunk. There, that is totally incompatible with a Christian's lifestyle. That's what Paul says here. But it doesn't say you can't drink a beer, as many Christians have always told me. In my life as a Christian, you, it's okay to drink beer or drink a wine or whatever the case may be. And it, years ago, I did a study under the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. I looked up the entry of wine. Because, it, you know, of course, they didn't have beer in those days, vodka, whatever. But at the very end of that article, it was a very interesting article that I read from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. And it said at the very end of this article, it said, because of the damaging and destructive nature of liquor or alcohol or the marketing of that liquor or alcohol and the destructive nature of that alcohol, that article said it's best to abstain totally from alcohol because of that nature of it, because in that day they didn't have all the marketing they do. You can go turn on the television. 
You can see the Budweiser, all the beer commercial. Funny, they stopped, they stopped cigarettes, but they kept the beer. You can go into the grocery store. You can go into the CVS pharmacy, and you can see beer stacked all the way to the ceiling. But they, but, but they put warning labels on cigarettes. My, well, my daddy never drank a beer. He smoked cigarettes, and he smoked all of his life as I was growing up. But he never came home and beat me or cussed me out, or, or he never cheated on my mother. He never did any of those things under the influence of a cigarette. But yet people do that all the time under the influence of alcohol. It's a very damaging and destructive thing. Well, the, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia said because of that, it's best that Christians do not drink beer or anything of that nature. Now, I know there are many Christians who do. All preachers, all pastors have to deal with that. But because of that article, and because I've seen the destructive nature of liquor or alcohol, what happens when a person is under the influence of alcohol? We've had, we've had cases recently of the destructive nature of liquor or alcohol. And we've seen how damaging and destructive it is. For example, our thinking, our reasoning ability becomes effective. When a person is drunk, they can become irrational. Now again, my daddy smoked cigarettes all my life growing up. He never came home and he never beat us, he never whipped us, he never, he never cussed us out, never abused us by smoking a cigarette. Now he'd get nervous. I've seen him get nervous and I've seen him do things. He, he would make people mad, but he, he wouldn't cuss them out. His, his personality didn't change, what I'm trying to say. But the thinking, the, the reasoning becomes affected when a person is under the influence of alcohol. They can become irrational in their thinking. And we see the destructive nature of alcohol on a person. For example, the judgment of a person has been, it will be impaired under the influence of alcohol. The judgment may be destroyed. You, you, walk out in this, you may walk out in the street. You don't see that car coming, or you don't know it's that close. You're, you're driving and you're drunk, and we know how that kills many, many innocent people. Liquor does that. Because we're not judging, okay, correct. We, our reasoning has been affected, our judgment. So we, we get in a wreck, we hit somebody. There's no ability to discern right and wrong when you're under the influence of liquor. You can't tell this is right, this is wrong. A person can be argumentative. They're more apt to fight, be violent. You see, if I've, I've watched enough of those police cops shows growing up, that a lot of times the police are called out to a house, it's a domestic disturbance. Probably 50% there's somebody who's been drinking liquor or drugs or something of that nature. And these are domestic fights. So we've seen, okay, that what liquor can do, we, we can, it destroys families. It destroys homes. It destroys lives. And we've seen examples of that recently in our own. So there's no ability. A person can become argumentative, fighting. They want to fight. You look at them the wrong way. They'll cuss you out. They want to fight, which is a, incompatible with the Christian lifestyle. The speech may become slurred. They become profane and vulgar when they're under the influence of liquor or alcohol. There's child abuse cases. There's domestic abuse, wife abuse. All of these things, okay, one person cannot tell me there's anything good that comes from liquor or alcohol. In other words, what I'm trying to say here, I'm trying to draw the comparison between, as Paul is doing here, when you're under the influence of liquor, it is, it is exactly the opposite of under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. All those things I've just mentioned are possible. And a person, you can just look at them. They'll walk down the street. They'll stagger. They can't walk straight. Well, the Bible is very clear about walking, walking in the life of Jesus Christ, walking in the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible has a lot to say about walking, walking, walking. 
The person who's under the influence of alcohol will stagger. They cannot walk. They cannot walk that line. My police make them walk that line. If you've been drinking, well, walk this line and see if you can do it straight. Well, that's the difference, okay? So what I'm trying to say here, I've said all of that, but I'm drawing the comparison like Paul is doing, and that's the key. It's not how much of the Holy Spirit you have. Now think about this. It's a misnomer. It's not that you have three quarters of him or half of him or a quarter. The real issue is not how much you have of him. How much does he have of you? How much does the Holy Spirit have of you? How much does the Holy Spirit control your life, your actions? All of these things are inconsistent with a Christian's lifestyle. So people will tell me, well, I'm a Christian, but they'll be drunk as a skunk. Something is wrong. That's not right. There's something not right there. That's, that's, that's opposite of what the Holy Spirit is to do. For all those things I mentioned, your judgment is gone, okay? You're irrational. You get fight. You fight somebody. You want to beat somebody up. They look at you the wrong way. You, you, you're, you're drunk. You cuss them out. You're argumentative. You abuse somebody. You get in the car and you kill somebody. You take an innocent life. All of these things are inconsistent with the life of a Christian and the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, Paul saying you cannot be under the influence of alcohol and under the influence of the Holy Spirit at the same time. It's impossible. Now, the Holy Spirit control of our life is the key here. So again, not how much do you have of him, but how much does he have of you? Now, the Old Testament has different ways and phrases of showing how the Spirit of God controls the life of the believer. And so these are some things as perhaps you're reading the Old Testament it has different ways of saying, again, some of confusing terms, okay? For example, the Holy Spirit was sometimes said to be in people or in men, not indwelling them like we would see in the New Testament, but in more in working, not in indwelling per se, even though he did indwell people. It was more to accomplish a task. Joseph says the Spirit of God was in him, the Spirit of God was in Bezalel. The Spirit of God was in the prophets as they prophesied. The Holy Spirit sometimes is said to have rested upon people. Now, these are peculiar phrases that are used in the Old Testament of the Spirit's work or control over the life of an individual believer. That's what we're talking about here. The Holy Spirit was upon people. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus if you remember, like a dove came, came down and light lit upon him and remained. That would be a more gentle phrase of the Spirit. He rested upon someone. Or sometimes it says the Holy Spirit was upon men in order to uh, enable them to do a task of some kind. It says the Holy Spirit clothed himself with men in order to accomplish a task. He clothed himself, he, like he put the person on. He put the, like a mantle, like you put a mantle on somebody. The Holy Spirit put the mantle on somebody else and worked through that person to accomplish his task. Sometimes it says he attacked people. It says he came mightily upon men. He literally attacked them. It says he attacked David. The Holy Spirit of God attacked David. The Holy Spirit of God attacked Samson. Book of Judges. You know the story? Book of Judges, Judges chapter 13, 16, was Samson. <clears throat> the he-man with the she-weakness was Samson. And you notice the humility of his life and how, how, God, what it, how he came to an end. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit came mightily upon him, attacked him. And you know what he did? He went down, not, not bought meals for everybody, and or he didn't go down and buy meals for all seniors or cut everybody's grass. Says he killed a thousand Philistines. You say, explain that one to me. 
the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you go down and kill a thousand people. Well, that's they were enemies. You remember, remember I said in a previous one, the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament was to fight for the nation of Israel. The Philistines were the major enemies. So the Spirit of God came upon Samson and he went down and killed a thousand of the enemy. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius. Uh, Peter is preaching in the house of the Gentile, Cornelius. And it says the Holy Spirit fell upon everyone that heard the word. And then, of course, we also see Samson. It says the Spirit of God moved him, moved him, caused him to step. Then sometimes the Scripture says the Holy Spirit entered into men in the Old Testament. In other words, possession. The Holy Spirit possessed men for a purpose. Then we use the term anointing. Anointing means singling out for service. It doesn't mean you can leap tall buildings at a single bound. It doesn't mean you can stop locomotives or anything like that. It just means you're set apart. That's what anointing means. I had a lady ask me years ago, was sitting next to her, and I said, I go to First Baptist Church, Jonesboro. And she said to me, she said, is your pastor anointed? I said, she went to a very prominent church in Atlanta at the time. And I said, well, what do you mean by anointed? She was, she was giving the word a meaning that it did not have in the Bible. I said, well, if, he, if you're mean raising the dead, no, he's not that kind of anointed. But anointing just simply means you're set apart for God's work. This pulpit is anointed. I'm anointed. doesn't mean I can go out there and stop a train. Uh, it means that God has set me apart for his work. All right, also we see the Spirit of God empowers men or bestows the ability to accomplish a task. So in conclusion here, we've, we've tried to settle the fact <clears throat> that it's not how much of the Holy Spirit we have, but it's how much the Holy Spirit has of us. So being filled with the Spirit is merely a term to be under the control of the Spirit. Now in our next Bible study, we'll be looking at how God does that, how he empowers people, believers, to accomplish his tasks in the ministry. And that's the gifts of the Spirit.